This is going to be Psalm 30. It's a Psalm of David, and David knew some things. Maybe you have a dad or a grandfather that you go to frequently because they know some things. They've lived much longer, and they have some things figured out. David is like that. He knows some things. Now, David's son Solomon, as you probably know, was the wisest man. If When somebody thinks of the wisest man, who do they think of? They think of Solomon. But I guarantee you, David knew some things that Solomon didn't know. So, don't go around always thinking that you know more than your father, your grandfather, your mother. You know, sometimes they know more than you. Even if there becomes a time when you think you're smarter than they are, you you need to remember they have they have the experience. They've been through some things that you've not been through, and they know some things. So I kind of want to talk about that, about some things that David knew that Solomon probably didn't really know or didn't know to the extent that David knew. Number one, David knew what the battle was like. In Psalm 30 and verse 1, it says, A psalm and song at the dedication of the house of David. It says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. David had some foes. He didn't have peace on every side, like Solomon did for the most part. He knew what it was like to get a javelin tossed at him. He knew what it was like to almost become a giant's microwave meal. I mean, have you ever thought about the fact that David knew how to fight and war a lot more than Solomon would? I mean, there's no way that Solomon could know more about the battlefield and about fighting giants than, than his father David. There's no way Solomon knew more. In that aspect, David said in Psalm 144, 1, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Solomon had peace for most of his reign. This is because David is a picture of Jesus Christ at the second coming, and Solomon is a picture of Jesus Christ at the millennial reign, a time of peace. David knew something else. He knew how to praise when the war was won. In Psalm 30 and verse 1, it says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. Extol means to praise and lift up in words. Now Solomon, we saw him praise the Lord, but he wouldn't know what, what it's like to really praise the Lord at the end of a battle in the sense that David would. In Psalm 68, 4, it says, Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and re rejoice before him. In Psalm 145, 1, David's psalm of praise, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. If you don't know what to say in praise to God, then find out what the Bible says about him and just say that. But David, he went through the trenches and gave glory to God when the battle was over. And that's some experiences the wise King Solomon didn't have. There's no way that he would have known what it was like to win as many battles as David and know what it's like to praise God at the end of those battles. So I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. So God lifted David up. He kept him alive as a mighty man in battle. David was a man of war, and yet he was alive to write this psalm. God lifted him up. He didn't let his foes to rejoice over him. He kept him alive long enough to write the book of Psalms. He kept him alive long enough to have the wisest son, Solomon. And God has lifted you up. You're alive to hear what I'm saying. I mean, you could have died already. In 2 Samuel twenty two forty nine, 49, it says, And that bringeth me forth from mine enemies, thou also hast lifted me up on high 
above them that rose up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. David was always being lifted up high above the enemy by the Lord. In Ephesians 1.22, it talks about how all things are under the Lord's feet. And if all things are under his feet, then he can put my enemies under my feet. And if my enemies are under my feet, then they, becomes the one, they become the ones that are grasshoppers in our sight instead of the other way around. In Ezekiel 8.3, the Bible uses that same phrase, lifted me up, that you just saw in Psalm 30 and verse 1. Ezekiel was lifted up by the Spirit and taken somewhere else entirely. Now, God may not lift you up and carry you through the air, but he can get you out of the situation you're in and put you somewhere else if you're needing out of that situation. So David says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. So there were times when David almost got it in the neck by his foes, but someone helped him. And God can send someone to help you. For example, in 2 Samuel 21, 16 through 17, it says, And Ishbi Binab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abisha, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the lot of Israel. And I'm sure this happened more than a few times on the battlefield where David almost got it in the neck and he had a friend that succored him, helped him, and didn't allow the giant to rejoice over David by slaying him that day. So God knows who to put in your life to help you out and deliver you. But David, he had these experiences. He would have known what it was like to fight Ishbi Binab. He would have known what it was like to have Ishbi Binab standing over you, drooling all over you, about to smash his foot into your face with his new sword, too. Solomon wouldn't have known what that was like. David knew some things that Solomon didn't. Your parents probably know something that you don't know. No matter how wise you think you are, they probably can tell you something that you don't know. The next thing is, David knew the right God. And I believe to a greater extent than Solomon did. In Psalm 30 and verse 2, it says, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Something that made David great was he knew the superiority of the Lord God. Not Baal, not Molech, not Ashtoreth, and certainly not himself. I mean, if a man in leadership can find out the Lord is king, then he can really lead some people. All the kings are compared to David, and they all fall short. You don't see David going after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, like Solomon did. David cried to God, and God healed him. He didn't have to go to see Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar Sign, or some other crook. He just cried unto the Lord. In Psalm 30 and verse 3, it says, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave, thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. If David were to go down, he wouldn't have went into torments like the rich man in Luke 16. He would have went to be comforted like Abraham and Lazarus in Luke 16. But up to this time, the Lord had been keeping him from the grave. Death was probably getting frustrated. You know, death... He would have liked to brag to the boys that he had finally gotten King David. But every time death would come to get David, the Lord would block him and David would stay alive. But David, he knew the right God. And he knew that that right God was the one keeping him alive. I believe that David had a closer relationship than Solomon. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I just believe David had a closer relationship to the Lord than Solomon. You don't see David worshiping Ashtoreth and Baal. Even when he messes up, he's crying to God. Next, David knew there was a song of fools 
before Solomon was even born. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7, 5, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. David knew the right songs to sing. David may not have had the wisdom of Solomon, but he wrote the Bible's hymn book, the book of Psalms. I mean, I bet Solomon couldn't play a harp like David. In Ecclesiastes 2.8, Solomon had to get himself men singers, men singers and women singers. David could play his own music. David had always had a spiritual song on his heart. He says in Psalm 30 and verse 4, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 talks about psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I mean, we can use the book of Psalms as our song book. I think David knew more about music than Solomon. He says, sing. Then he says, give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness in Psalm 30 and verse 4. So David knew some things about giving thanks, thanksgiving, being thankful. In Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. I think a parent ought to know much more about being thankful than their ch children. I think there's something wrong if you don't. In Psalm 100 and verse 4, it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. You'll never be happy until you're thankful for what you have. Sometimes when you see someone that's got a lot of stuff, it can make you unthankful for what you do have because you don't got what they've got. Uh, I've got to where I'm thankful that I don't have all that stuff that they've got. I don't have enough time to take care of what I do have. I don't need all that. I don't need five vehicles and three houses and all this other stuff. People ask me, you know, why don't you ever go fishing? Why don't you ever go hunting and golfing and bike riding and hiking, all this other stuff or whatever they do? I just don't see how I could free up enough time to do all that stuff. I'm thankful for what I got going on right now. I don't need anything else. In Ecclesiastes 5.12, it says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. This is what Solomon said. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. You know, I'm just thankful for a job and a place to lay down and go to sleep. Uh, that's all we really need. We need the Lord. We need the Bible. And if you've got food and a place to lay down and sleep, then you should be thankful. Give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. When I think about how holy God is, it reminds me to be thankful that we don't serve a wicked God. We would all be in a mess. We would all get burned up. He would have already made Kentucky Fried Chicken out of me. He would have fried me a long time ago. Next, I believe David knew more about the anger of God. In Psalm 30 and verse 5, it says, For his anger endureth but a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a moment, but joy cometh in the morning. So his anger endureth but a moment. He doesn't stay angry forever. It says in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So the Lord's mercies are new every morning. He doesn't stay angry forever. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. When you've had a bad day, you go to sleep at night, and it's all better in the morning most times. It's like a reset button. God has it worked out that way. Every morning, wake up, acknowledge God, say, God, I want to do better than yesterday. And his mercies are new every morning, and joy cometh in the morning. For his anger endureth but a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The future tribulation time period will be a time when God shows his anger for a moment, for a little time. The weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And the morning, that's the second coming. That is when joy comes, and that's when the Lord comes back with ten thousands of his saints. I believe David would have had a better understanding of the anger of God from experience. Now, I'm kind of speculating here, but, I mean, remember the situation with him and Bathsheba? 
Remember the situation with him numbering Israel and the angel of the Lord coming down with a sword and David could visibly see the angel of the Lord and he was afraid. I mean, obviously Solomon provoked the Lord to anger with his strange wives. But I'm, I, it, from what I read, it seems like the Lord took it a little bit easier on Solomon than he did David. And this is just speculation, but it's just a thought. It seems he, he kind of took it on easy on Solomon because he was David's son in a way. But I believe David knew more about the anger of God. I believe David knew more about tough times. David knew more about coming up rough. He was a shepherd boy that killed a bear and a lion. Then he fought Goliath. He survived Saul trying to kill him and many other things just as a young kid. I mean, I don't believe Solomon grew up like David did. I, I think Solomon was kind of born a little bit with a silver spoon in his mouth. I mean, he was the king's son. David, obviously not as rich as Solomon, but still... He would be well off. And David says in Psalm 30 and verse 6, And in my prosperity, I said I shall never be moved. So David's saying there, he's like, When I was in my prosperity, I said I wouldn't be moved. You know, when things are going good, you start feeling invincible. You start feeling like nothing can take you down. And if David is saying that, imagine what Solomon thought in his prosperity. He was the most prosperous of all time, pretty much. I mean, he would make Greg Bezos and Elon Musk look nowhere near as rich. I mean, when things are going good, you start thinking you're invincible when you got a lot of prosperity going on. You start thinking that it's going to be good forever. But you need to realize that God can pull the rug out from under you before the day is over. The best thing to do in prosperity is keep the Bible closer to you than ever before. And if you have the Lord and His Word, then that is all you need. We are really all in prosperity right now. I mean, most people listening to this is in prosperity. We have, we have it made. But I'm going to set my affection on things above. I don't need to take anything for granted because it can be taken away tomorrow. You, you need to realize you're not invincible. You need to realize that you could croak over tonight. You can be moved in prosperity. Don't say in your prosperity, I shall never be moved. Say, God, if you want to knock me out right now, it would be easy for you to. You could, wouldn't even have to think about it. You could just do it. Just, You could kill me, take everything I've got, ruin me. Uh, there would be nothing for God to do that. God's showing you mercy by not doing that. In Psalm 30 and verse 7, it says, Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. If a tribulation saint reads this, then they can take it really literal. Because, I mean, if they're going to be hiding in the rocks from the Antichrist's henchmen, henchmen when they flee to the mountains, they can say, Thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. It says in Psalm 37 and verse uh, Psalm 37 through 8, Lord, thy favor, Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. So who are you crying to for help? The world? Are you going to the world for help first? Are you going to your addiction for help, for comfort? The modern G God's little gods, the modern the modern day little g gods of America there are addictions. People go to their addictions for comfort and for help instead of going to the Lord. Sometimes they go to their riches. Are you going to your riches for help? Solomon was so rich that it was probably hard for him to not trust in riches. 1 Timothy 6.17 probably, it says, it probably gives a good verse for Solomon. It says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Imagine how hard it would be to not trust in your riches when you're as rich as King Solomon. We all probably would. I think David knew more about what it was like to trust in the Lord and not in his riches than Solomon did. I mean, his riches wouldn't have been able to help him on the battlefield. I mean, when he's got a giant standing in front of him, uh, the giant would just 
smack him down and take his money. I mean, he had to fight. He had to go through tough times and he, where he would have to trust in the Lord. I believe he would have had a better understanding than Solomon in that aspect. Well, God gave Solomon wisdom that goes beyond any of us. Solomon's dad, David, still could have told him a thing or two. No matter how smart you get, a godly parent can school you on some things. Even if you've read the Bible more than them. Even if you've heard more preaching than them. There are some things that they went through, learned from experience, that you don't have yet. David knew the right God he needed to cry to. And this wasn't an always a common thing in the Bible. You'll notice they're crying to all kinds of gods in the Bible. It says in Judges ten thirteen through 14, The Lord says, Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. So the Lord's telling them, You've cried to them gods so much. Instead of me, and you think they can help you, go cry to them. See if they're going to help you out in your tribulation. But David knew the right God to make supplications to. I mean, how can you be supplied by a God that can't see, hear, or walk like the gods they were worshiping? In Philippians 4.19, it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Psalm 30 and verse 9, What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? You know, David is saying that, you know, he's wanting to keep he wants the Lord to keep him alive. So he's saying, if God lets him die, then David's not going to be able to praise him on earth and declare the truth of the word of God to the word, the world anymore. If the Lord just lets him go down to the pit and go back to the dust, then he's not going to be praising the Lord on the earth anymore. So David is appealing to God on that fact. Uh, David knew Genesis 3.19 said, For dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. He knew he was going back to the dust, but he wasn't, re he wasn't wanting to go down to the pit yet. He was wanting to stay alive. He was, uh, and he was saying this fact to the Lord. He's like, who's going to declare thy truth? So he's saying, you know, if you keep me alive, I'm going to declare your truth. I'm going to praise you. Solomon expressed his view on this, he says in Ecclesiastes 3.20, All go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. So Solomon knew he would go back to the dust. Just like David knew he was going back to the dust. Psalm 30 and verse 10, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. David knew where to go for help. I believe even more to a greater extent than Solomon did. Solomon sought the Lord for wisdom to lead the people. But I believe the Lord knew where to, I mean, that David knew where to go for help even to a greater extent than Solomon. It says in Isaiah 31, 1, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. You see, Solomon took wives from other nations. For example, he married Pharaoh's daughter. Maybe this was to form an alliance there. This is not a wise decision. Don't go to Egypt for help. I mean, we know this letter led to Solomon's downfall, taking all these strange wives. David says in Psalm 30 and verse 11, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded, girded me with gladness. So he's turned his mourning into dancing. David knew there was a time to dance. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Psalm 30 and verse 11, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. David knew there was a time to take off the sackcloth because there was a time to laugh. There was a time to quit mourning and start dancing. I mean, they put sackcloth on during times of mourning. David knew there was a time to take that off. He knew how to be balanced. David knew some things. He says in verse 12, To the end, that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. David knew there was a time to speak and not to be silent. 
Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 3, 7, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. There are times when it is better to keep your mouth shut, but there is also a time to open your mouth. You should open your mouth and praise to God and not be silent. You should open your mouth to proclaim the gospel. David says, I will give thee thanks forever. People are so unthankful that it's almost like they acknowledge Halloween, skip Thanksgiving, and go straight to Christmas. Uh, they overlook that holiday where you be thankful. People in the last days are classified by Paul as being unthankful. So David was all about being thankful. David knew some things. He was a wise man. Maybe not as wise as Solomon, but he could teach Solomon quite a bit. He had experiences that Solomon never had. But that's just a quick, quick thought for Psalm 30.